Welcome to the Atslander YouTube channel. Now, a sensory approach to exotica, ritual practice, and cosmology at Chaco Canyon with Robert Weiner, who's currently postdoctoral fellow at Dartmouth College. Take it away, Rob. Go ahead. All righty. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jim, for your very generous introduction. And Jim and Michael are real uh, heroes of archaeology, I would say, with all the scholars they bring in to speak in the Otzlander organization. And I'm very happy to be counted among those uh, to share some of my research with you. And I also appreciate you extending the invitation, uh, you know, into what I would think of personally as the northern end of Mesoamerica, but maybe not always thought of as Mesoamerican in, in the U.S. Southwest. So thank you for inviting me and thank you all for tuning in. So this talk is going to be a uh, perhaps more intensive and, and more deeply thought out version of a paper that I published in 2015 with the title of the talk, A Century Approach to Exotica Ritual Practice and Cosmology at Chaco Canyon. I've been thinking about these issues a lot more in the intervening uh, eight years, and I've completed a doctorate in that time on the roads of Chaco, so those will play into the argument as well. And uh, I look forward to our conversation afterwards, Q&A, um, and, and hearing what you all think. So with no further ado, let's get to it. So what was Chaco? I mean, it's uh, a little hard if we were in an auditorium, I'd ask how many people had been to Chaco or heard of Chaco, but I'm guessing, and many of you likely have as archeological aficionados, but if, um, if not, I'm gonna give a little basic background on the site and some of the key questions that archeologists um, think and wonder about. And uh, so we're gonna look at this first big question, what was Chaco? And then I'm gonna suggest uh, maybe why we should stop asking this question. So what is Chaco? At what level, Chaco is a canyon located here in the very arid San Juan Basin of the Four Corners region of the U.S. Southwest. So it's a basin you can see defined by mountain ranges in, in different directions. And one thing apparent from this Google Earth view is just how arid Chaco Canyon is. <clears throat> All of these surrounding regions, so these are the Chusca Mountains, the Zuni Mountains, the Jemez and the um, Nacimiento Mountains, these all receive, like the flanks of these peaks receive much more rainfall, they have much more productive soils, uh, they have like a month longer growing season than Chaco. Within this whole, some of my colleagues would disagree, but uh, that, you know, maybe Chaco was good for farming, but I find it very hard to suggest Chaco was ever a good place for agriculture. Within this basin, it's basically the driest place with the shortest growing season and the worst soil. Uh, and yet, you can see here, there are also no trees in Chaco. Um, and the most recent uh, paleo, you know, environmental studies have, have their findings have confirmed or, or reinforced the idea that there were never trees growing in Chaco, even a thousand years ago when, when the ancient ones were, were still uh, occupying and living in the canyon. So it's, this is a, a view of the harsh land. And yet uh, the ancestors of the Dinat and the Pueblo people sought out this place, Chaco Canyon, to create some of the most incredible monumental architecture in, in the Americas and really, I would say, in the world. This is a building shown in this slide known as Pueblo Bonito, um, something like eight, between 600 and 800 rooms stood up to four stories tall. Um, you can see these circular structures, which are known as kivas. There are two main types. These larger ones uh, like this are known as great kivas. These are probably ceremonial gathering places. Um, where large numbers of people could get together for some kind of ritual or just a big meeting, but they certainly could accommodate many people. And then these smaller kivas, Southwestern archaeologists differ. Many would suggest those were also ritual chambers, just used by fewer numbers of people. Although others, such as uh, Steve Lexen, one of my dear mentors, who I know has spoken to you all at Atzlander before, uh, Steve would suggest the smaller kivas are actually where people are living, which I think is a, a rather compelling idea. In, in either case, whether people are living in the small kivas or in the rooms, not very many people lived in Pueblo Benito. Uh, 
current estimates, well, they're all over the place, but very few cooking hearths or normal domestic floor features were found in Pueblo Benito. Most of the rooms were very difficult to access. You couldn't build fires in them. They had doors that could be sealed for storage. So I think an estimate of somewhere in, you know, at most a couple hundred people living in this building, probably powerful uh, religious elites. We'll see evidence for that in a moment. Um, so it, while this building has this monumental grandeur size loft, it's not like a big apartment. This is something much more like a temple, which I've argued in, in uh, numerous publications. Uh, Pueblo Benito is not the only great house in Chaco Canyon. There are at least 12 in the canyon. And as you can see in this slide, uh, the great houses have a variety of orientations. Many of them are in the cardinal directions like Pueblo Alto, Hungo Pavi, Pueblo Benito, north, south, east, west, therefore aligning more with the sun and the time of equinox. There are also, you'll notice these um, sort of tilted towards the southeast orientations, Penasco Blanco, Pueblo del Arroyo, and those correspond to a long lunar cycle known as the uh, lunar standstill, which uh, probably don't have time to get into here, but it's an 18 and a half year lunar cycle where the moon goes from very extreme positions, uh, rising further north and further south than the sun does at the solstice once every 18 and a half years. We're actually coming up on that event this year. Um, and the Chacoans, also the Cahokians of, of ancient North America were very interested in lunar standstills and aligned many structures um, to these events. So anyway, the structures are also laid out in, in an overarching plan relative to each other, where these buildings are north-south of each other on the mesa tops, east-west, and others are aligned with one another on these lunar lines. So the entire canyon was set up with this astronomical template. Building these buildings required immense effort. Not only were people quarrying the stone, carrying it, shaping it, building the walls, they also had to carry somewhere, or it's been estimated approximately 240,000 timbers by foot to the canyon. The nearest trees to Chaco uh, to build roofing timbers were growing about 90 kilometers away. So that's at least, what, seven, about 70 miles? Um, so, and these were probably being carried with tump lines across the forehead. Some colleagues and I recently published a, a paper on that in the Journal of Archaeological Science reports. So massive effort being put into these structures that very few people are living in. Just to give you a, a little bit more of a sense of the astronomy, this is a photo of the lunar standstill, how those moon rises and sets would align with the walls. There's also the famous sun dagger petroglyph in Chaco rediscovered and, and um, researched and publicized by Anna Sofer and the Solstice Project. So if we return to this look at the canyon, we go here, this is a, a butte called Fajada Butte, looks like this. Uh, that circle's in the wrong place, but if we were to look at this area right here, um, there are slabs of sandstone leaning up against the cliff where the sun and moon create various uh, shadow patterns. So the sun comes through the top of the slabs to create a dagger right down, perfectly down the center of that spiral on summer solstice, two daggers perfectly bracketing that spiral on winter solstice, a smaller spiral marking the equinox, and then over the nine and a quarter years of that fully 18 and a half year lunar cycle, the shadow is moving along these nine and a quarter turns, no coincidence there, to uh, mark those extreme points of, of the moon. And that is the moon casting a shadow as it rises at midwinter. So one of the most incredible astronomical constructs anywhere in the ancient world here at Chaco showing the immense power that the astronomy had for the people. Now, I think it's important to pause here to ponder and reflect on the different notion of astronomy that existed uh, in most time periods, cultures, and places that are not the contemporary West, where the sun and the moon are not lifeless objects of study, um, peered at through a telescope and considered inanimate objects, but rather in among the, the ancestral cultures of the Chacoans, um, of the today's Pueblo and Diné people, certainly among the Maya and other Mesoamerican people, the sun and the moon are deities. They're beings with whom we can form relationships through making offerings, through prayers. It's a, it's a relational worldview in which 
humans are not the soul beings with an interiority with a soul or spirit whatever you know we can use different words and argue over the different words but certainly the sun and the moon were considered live living deities in chaco and so to create this sun dagger these building alignments was not simply a sort of uh ho-hum activity so that we know when to plant of course knowing when to plant is important but it's bringing the human constructions into alignment into harmony into cosmic conversation with these powerful beings of the sky and this is um a huge source of power throughout time in human societies and it's a huge component of of practices that we would call religion right because the sun, it's not just that, oh, we think this thing up in the sky has a soul. They really do affect our lives. The moon is, oh, time is told. It moves the tides. There are many agricultural people who say that, you know, you only plant, I forget, you plant during a full moon or you don't plant during a full moon. The sun, of course, changes through the seasons. It goes away. It's cold. It comes back. There's heat. It dries things up. It's, again, used for telling time. So they really do affect our lives, the, the celestial bodies. And, and the ancient ones recognized that and they sought to establish harmonious relationships with, with these beings to have a fruitful life and a fruitful society. And so this was certainly um, a major component of Chacoan religion. This is another picture of the sun dagger just showing you that incredible dagger of light shooting through the center of the spiral. Which Anna so fair. I love you know the story of Anna finding finding this is incredible. She was volunteer artist, not um, you know formally trained in archaeology, which was actually quite a benefit to having an open mind in the 1970s when so much uh, professional archaeology was all about economics and energetics and uh, modeling that sort of stuff. So Anna just happened to uh, be volunteering to record rock art in China uh, in Chaco, not China, Chaco. She to the top of Fajada Butte and it was close to solstice and saw this happening and with her well she's a genius in her own right but with her, her artist's eye she said oh this is something that really matters and she had been studying Mesoamerican archaeoastronomy just out of interest before that and it turned out to be one of the most incredible astro archaeo astronomical findings known to date so um, the sun and the moon really crucial uh, foci in Chaco and religious practice. And just to further show that it's the, certainly the Sun Dagger site itself, but also Fajada Butte, this towering landform upon which the Sun Dagger was constructed, really mattered in Chaco and society. We know today, you know, talk, I work closely with a number of Diné people, Navajo people, and, and Pueblo people as well. And um, landforms are, are what matter. You know, the Landforms are their church, so to speak. It's where deities reside. It's where powers reside. They certainly chose to build the sun dagger, the ancient Chacoans, atop Fajada Butte because it's this, you know, it impacts you through its monumental loft of this thing that occurring in the center of a canyon. And uh, just to further reinforce how important it was to the Chacoans, I have arrows here marking a human constructed ramp roadway that went up the, that they built so that people could periodically ascend Fajada Butte to visit the Sun Dagger site, to make offerings, probably to make prayers for rain from this high point where you can see all the distant clouds and landforms. But uh, many of the, I'll talk a little more about roads, but many of the roads in Chaco and society led to um, these powerful landforms and Fajada Butte with the Sun Dagger was, was certainly one of those. Now, I mentioned briefly the connection between astronomy and, let's say, authority or political power. And we have very clear evidence in Chaco and society that it was not, um, that there were some serious class differences. So applied together by uh, a dear colleague and a great 3D modeler, Rich Friedman. He would probably be a great person to have on here if you're ever looking for speakers. But Rich has modeled here Pueblo Benito which you can see with its 800 rooms, four stories, absolutely incredible. And these platform mounds out front. And what he's juxtaposed here in the, in the left corner is one of the, you know, Chaco is also filled with these small um, domestic sites, 
where actually there are trash middens and there's clear evidence that people are living in them, unlike the great houses. They're often called the BC sites. But you can see, I mean, a single normal residence would fit in a tiny little corner <laughs> of Pueblo Benito. And so you have a small number of folks living in the great houses, buried with lavish goods that we're going to learn a lot more about in this talk. And then on the other side of the canyon, you cross over the wash, there's lots of these little smaller houses where people whose, um, you know, their skeletal remains show that they, were, they had less healthy, they, they did, could not eat as well as those high status folks in the great house. So it's, um, as we've seen many times in human history, religious knowledge, religious abilities translate into political authority. And uh, if you're living in the great house lined up where the sun rises and you know where it's going to rise and you know the prayers to talk to the sun, you get to live in a giant house and everybody else probably helps feed you. Now, Chaco is not just the canyon I showed you with the 12 great houses. When I use the term Chaco and, and many uh, you know, Southwestern archaeologists, we are referring to this vast region, which is about um, 100,000 square kilometers, 75,000 square miles. So this is about um, the size of Ohio, where there are 150 communities that replicate the Chaco style of architecture. These are known as outlier great houses. So they take these sort of sacred architectural templates established in the canyon and they replicate them throughout this large region, uh, spanning all four corner states. Uh, the labeled sites are sites I worked at for my dissertation research that don't really matter for this talk, but it's the map I had on hand of the Chaco world. So you'll also see um, blue lines. Well, I should find a little bit here. Different archeologists will have different opinions, whether this was a united sort of kingdom Steve Lexon would say that this was based on the Mesoamerican Altepet, um, sort of city-state with a noble and commoner class. Others see this as a network of people sort of wanting to be like Chaco, but not really connected. I see this certainly as a unified um, entity, but I see it unified, I mean, probably through politics, but certainly through religious belief and religious practice. So when we look at this Chaco world, often the term thrown out by archaeologists is the Chaco phenomenon because we don't understand it. Why is everybody building like Chaco? Well, I would suggest it's not a phenomenon. It's maybe not even a polity, but it's a religious movement. Just like we see cathedrals spreading all over Europe, we see great houses spreading all over the four corners. And that's that architecture represents a set of beliefs and practices and ways of relating with the powers of the cosmos that um, gave Chaco its allure and power. We'll get much more into that uh, in, in the following details of this talk. Uh, we'll go back quickly. You see these blue lines indicated on this map. These are what are known as Chacoan roads. These are the focus of my doctoral dissertation. And I'll walk us through quickly just what the roads are because they occur throughout this huge region and they teach us a lot about what was going on in the Chaco culture. You can see a road here. They're very, very straight. They're wide. They're nine meters wide. That's about 30 feet. And these uh, the Chacoan people didn't have wheeled vehicles, carts, pack animals. So like the great houses being way bigger than they need to be for daily life. So it is with the roads, which is pretty simple, especially from a Mesoamerican perspective, it's monumental architecture. It's big, it's meant to make a statement. This is just to show you the massive size of one of these roads that could still be seen easily in the early 20th century. The roads often go straight up and down cliffs with el via elaborate staircases, like you see here in the canyon near Hungo Pavi. Uh, there's a lot of sort of vertical movement emphasized with the roads that they're not, you know, if you're carrying lots of logs and pottery and goods along the roads, uh, you wouldn't expect them to go straight up and down cliffs, but the Chacoans often go straight up and down topographic obstacles because they're trying to get at uh, places of sort of religious importance and power much more than an economically efficient route. It's just another staircase. And uh, this is showing you, the, again, the multiplicity of the roads in the canyon. These are something like probably formalized processional ways. Um, we'll get back to processions later in this talk because they're key to understanding the Mesoamerican goods. But um, the canyon is full of these 30 foot wide roadways. So we touched on this briefly that uh, Chaco and archaeologists are often wondering um, what are, you know, why does everybody building roads? Why is everybody building great houses across this big region? 
Um, there's a lot of models out there. And what I propose and what I will argue in this talk is that that distribution is showing us a religious movement, a religious movement, meaning a particular way of building a set of practices, set of beliefs about how to connect with the powers in the world, powers of the sky, of the land, of the water, which give meaning to people's lives. They give political power to leaders and they change human histories. This notion is really um, emphasized in the way native people talk about Chaco and society. I include a few quotes here from, from Pueblo folks, some of whom I know, some of whom I don't know, but are, have uh, spoken publicly about what was going on in Chaco, like Patuch here, who you know, speaks that in Chaco, they were so in tune with the natural forces, they could control those forces that could be abused by people. So this idea of sort of having control over nature, being so in tune with it that um, people are exploiting that. Uh, Paul Pino from Laguna Pueblo puts it very um, powerfully, where he says, in our history, they talk of things that occurred a long time ago, of people who had enormous power, spiritual power, and power over people. I think those kind of people lived here in Chaco. He continues, at Chaco, there were very powerful people who had a lot of spiritual power, and these people probably used their power in ways that caused things to change. And that may have been one of the reasons the migrations were set to start again. So we're seeing a theme here of power, spiritual power, meaning sort of religious power, abilities with, with uh, relating to the sun, the moon, the entities of land and sky, but also that leading to control over people that eventually was not continued in Pueblo cultures or in Diné cultures. Again, Ed Ladd from Zuni saying, we look upon Chaco Canyon, especially Pueblo Benito, if people, where people of great power lived at one time. That term in, in native circles, power, is, is uh, in my experience and my understanding, used much more often to refer to spiritual powers and the ability to sort of um, make change in the natural world more so than uh, we think of sort of political might. But of course, the two are also linked. So he says the people who live in the circular house, uh, Pueblo Benito had magical powers, power over animals and birds and so forth. So we're really getting the sense that at Chaco, a big part of its power came from these sort of spiritual abilities. And finally, uh, one Diné tradition from a man named Old Man Buffalo Grass, who tells a, you know, a brief version of this story called the story of the great gambler, um, who says he won from the people all their corn and their goods. He made them build a great house for him. Everyone worked for him. He won the natural elements, the male rain, the female rain, the rainbows, the rivers, the mountains, and the rest of the land went dry for it only rained where he lived. So again, we have this sense of very um, powerful leaders at Chaco. So I want to turn now to my understanding from an archaeological perspective of what that, um, how that spiritual power, those spiritual abilities, that religious um, prowess was manifest in Chaco and society. And, and this begins by taking a step back and thinking theoretically for a moment about uh, what has been, if, if people are into anthropological theory here, this is often called um, the new materialisms, could also even just be called materiality. But this is the idea that um, our lives as human beings are completely enmeshed with physical objects. Here I have my cell phone. Uh, here I have these keys that allow me to walk into my new apartment. They allow me to start my car. Um, I'm using a mouse without which I could not be giving this presentation. I drink out of cups. The way I move is completely um, shaped by the constructed environment around me. Um, what I see affects how I behave. So uh, seeing a totally, you know, when I first arrived at Dartmouth, uh, gosh, yesterday, you know, seeing for the first time these towering buildings, this very impressive place, it, it, it affects you emotionally. That causes one to make different decisions, behave in different ways. So the point of all of this is that our lives are entirely wrapped up with physical things, but also they can be thought of physical things, places, landforms, the sun, the moon, the rain, the wind. These can all be thought of as exerting a sort of agency, a sort of um, ability to cause change in the world. There's, there's kind of no question that the rain causes change in the world. 
as I talked of earlier, the sun and the moon, these are things that really affect our lives. And um, so much of archaeology often focuses on, and understandably, right, human beings, human, uh, what humans have done, but what's left to us when we look at the past are physical things, our physical spaces, our landforms. And so uh, in, this, uh, in recent years, archaeologists have turned to thinking about, you know, sort of the, the agentic role of places and things in how history unfolds. And this is very consonant, you know, very resonant with the way indigenous peoples, especially in the Americas, um, conceive of the world as a world in which um, matter is animate, in which um, things we consider inert are actually full of spirit, life, have um, being and personality. And so there is an interesting sort of coming together of indigenous ways of thought and anthropological theorizing that I think really helps us to approach the um, archaeological record of Chaco and understand what happened. And I want to um, just hang around on the theory side for, for a moment longer to consider the um, one particular type of physical goods that cause a big difference in the world. And those are what I call exotica or exotic goods. There's a wonderful little book, if anyone's looking for a fun read, called Ulysses Sale by a, an anthropologist named Mary Helms, in which she compiles uh, case study after case study from different you know, small scale societies about the power, um, sort of the conceptual and religious and political power inherent in um, people who go far away from their groups territory into distant unknown lands and they come back with uh, knowledge of objects and those things are frequently imbued with a sort of uh, supernatural quality uh, a great power i mean we see this a little bit in our contemporary culture but it's um widely uh, demonstrated pattern in in sort of smaller scale pre pre-colonial or extra modern societies that physical distance equals i, I probably wouldn't uh, i probably should say uh, cosmological distance rather than supernatural but physical distance is cosmological distance so to go very far away is to go to a realm that is dangerous and yet where this power this sort of spiritual mana can be acquired and brought back maybe in objects maybe in knowledge and then those things um, often play a big role in, in the sort of religious life and political life of how societies unfold when those objects are brought back. So certainly the case at Chaco. So I'm now going to walk us through some of the main classes of artifacts of material culture that um, have been found in the great houses that I think give us a window into um, the, the, the characteristics of loved turquoise. Um, it doesn't occur naturally in the canyon. They had to go at least, uh, I'd say at least set probably further to the Cerrios Hill to obtain turquoise. They also obtained it from as far away as Nevada, Arizona. So again, uh, turquoise is one of these not exactly ex as exotic as the Mesoamerican goods, but it's not local to the canyon. Uh, it was worked into beads and pendants in Chacoan society, probably by those folks living in the small house sites. It, uh, much of the painted wood used for things, probably like ritual altars that are found in Chacoan rooms, where the most common color they were painted was turquoise. Um, there were two very elite individuals uh, interred in Pueblo Benito. Uh, there were two middle-aged men. Uh, they were pro could have been the founders of the whole religious movement. They were buried at very early on in the Chacoan sequence in the mid 800s, but they were buried with 26,000 pieces of turquoise just with the guys. And then I think another uh, 20,000 in the room above where their descendants uh, were buried. Their mat people related um, in a family over 300 years were buried in that same room um, for the next 300 years and covered in turquoise. So it was a very important uh, material in Chaco and society. Now, why, you know, what is it 
about turquoise that strikes us or is interesting? Well, probably the, I mean, the most apparent thing is the color, right? It's turquoise is notable here. I got a turquoise bracelet on. Uh, turquoise is most notable for its blue green hue. And based on what is known, you know, about, uh, well, in the arid Southwest, the most precious and, and necessary substance is water. What's needed is water to come, to fall, to grow the crops, water, lakes, bodies of water are often seen as the dwelling places of deities. Springs are very important. It's all about water in this incredibly arid landscape. Turquoise is that color of the sky where the rain clouds form and fall. It's the color of those deep alpine lakes where um, the spirits, the holy ones uh, reside. And to find this stone that I think of as sort of perhaps the power of water crystallized, materialized, made solid, solidified into something workable that could then be worn by the special powerful people in Chaco um, speaks to probably why it was accumulated in such great quantities among you know, a culture that really values water. Furthermore, it's stated in, in some of the Diné stories about the great gambler, it's stated that um, because the great gambler controlled all the turquoise, he controlled the rain. So there's a pretty explicit link made in some of those um, indigenous traditions. Other traces of water were also important to the uh, Chaco and religious movement. And these are shells and fossil shells. Um, shells were brought into Chaco from a variety of directions. Um, Gulf of, uh, you know, from the California side, from down near Texas, down along um, the Mesoamerican coast as well. Um, probably traded up through the Hohokam, a lot of it, made into bracelets, made into pendants. Um, some of it probably made into tinklers to make that sound like you hear in many contemporary dances where shells clanging together make a sound evocative of rain and water and uh, sprinkling. Additionally, there are um, fossils of shells cached in many Chacoan rooms. Oh, and I should say that shell commonly co-occurs with turquoise in um, the Chacoan rooms and, and even today in, in uh, you know, Pueblo and Navajo jewelry. Here I'm wearing a necklace of shell and turquoise. The two are paired because that reinforces the water associations. This, I think, exemplifies the, the watery um, focus of Chacoan um, religion even more, which is a, this beaut I saw, I found this, I think in, I don't remember if it's Smithsonian or American Museum of Natural History, but it's a little frog carved out of a piece of shell. So there you've got water and water. But what I think is perhaps even more significant than the shells accumulated in the buildings is the fact that Chaco's natural sandstone landscape is replete with traces of an ancient watery past. This was the interior Western, I for, sorry, I'm forgetting the name, exact name of it now, the interior Western uh, sea in, you know, millions and millions of years ago. But the fossilized traces of that are frozen into the ground throughout Chaco's landscape. So walking around Chaco today, one sees these sort of ripple wave patterns crystallized in the exposed sandstone. There are many places where shells are coming out of the sandstone. And you know, if the Chacoans are quarrying the millions, I would guess, of bricks, you know, of pieces of sandstone to create those massive buildings, they're cutting into the local sandstone. They're gonna be seeing shells all the time. They're gonna be seeing these traces of the watery past. Others include these uh, shrimp burrows fossilized into the rock. And so today, in, in, and in the Chacoan era, it was a land of dryness. You know, sure it would rain sometimes, but there are no trees. It's very dry, very arid sandstone, harsh land. And yet in this sort of magical place, the traces of the ancient watery past are there in the landscape. And Pueblo people and Diné people speak of previous worlds filled with water that their ancestors emerged out of. So it's possible that Chaco was seen as the sort of living remnant of one of these previous ancestral eras and associated with water and therefore great power with the time depth as well. This is just showing more of the, the fossils that one uh, comes, comes into contact, comes into relation with throughout the uh, Chaco landscape. There's cacao. 
uh, here come. Yeah. I see Jim, uh, liking that one, of course, being brought up from uh, the tropics of Mesoamerica. Cacao does not grow in the U S Southwest. Um, Mike Matthewitz would suggest it's coming up from the West coast of Mexico. Um, I don't know. He's probably right. He knows a lot of things and he's a very good scholar. Uh, in any case, it's coming up from Mesoamerica. And for it was initially noted by an archaeologist named Dorothy Washburn that this characteristic Chacoan vessel style, these cylindrical vessels, uh, looked a lot like the Maya cacao pots, which, of course, in Maya context, it's known that they're uh, cacao pots because they say cacawa. You know, you can read them. Uh, in 2009, uh, uh, Great Chaco archaeologist at University of New Mexico, Patty Crown, and a colleague, I think, from the Hershey Foundation, they um, they performed residue analysis on the Chaco and cylinder vases and confirmed they did indeed hold cacao residue. So perhaps they're being used the same way in Chaco as in Mesoamerica, frothing the beverage back and forth. But in either case, they're um, certainly someone is going to this distant land, bringing back. Um, this new amazing substance, which of course is full of the chemical compound theobromine, which is uh, people often think, I, I'm pretty sure this is right, that um, that is the, I don't think cacao has caffeine. I think the psychoactive sort of, you know, buzzing component of cacao is, is what's known as theobromine. And uh, so people in the Chaco world, you never would have tasted, you never would have seen you know, this sort of strange brown liquid, frothy, who knows what they were flavoring it with, and then to drink it and reach this new mental state was uh, a real demonstration of these religious leaders' power, their connection to the divine, and probably the substance itself was seen as something um, very powerful, just as I don't know that much about the Mesoamerican context, but I've heard, you know, cacao accompanies the elites in their journey through the underworld, and it was a certainly a, a powerful beverage and used as currency at times. So um, it was part of Chacoan culture coming from these distant lands, giving people a new mental state, hearing those bubbling sounds like the water again, which is so important in the culture. So another important aspect. Copper bells. Um, they were found in a variety of contexts in Chaco. There's no sort of big cache of them. Uh, the one on left side of the image is a Chacoan bell. On the right is a probably what they, those are West Mexican bells from post-classic period. So they're probably what the Chacoan bells look like before they uh, corroded. But um, again, metal not known in the ancient Southwest. And then suddenly these people come back from this distant land, or maybe someone goes on a pilgrimage to Chaco and they're suddenly hearing for the first time, this incredible new sound, maybe related again to the rainfall, this, this sort of tinkling magic. And in, in West Mexican context, where the bells are coming um, from to Chaco, they were purposefully crafted in two hues. So metallurgy developed in West Mexico as a way of creating different sonic qualities of the bells, but also different colors of the compounds of copper. And they created two, I, I guess, or, yeah, one is more gold tone and one is more silver. And those were associated with the sun and the moon. So again, we have all of the astronomy in the buildings, probably linking in with the colors and the sounds of these bells, maybe being played at night, maybe being played in the depths of these dark uh, great houses. Um, truly evidence of power and spiritual um, ability among those Chacoans who could go and acquire them. This is uh, one of my favorites now, the macaws. So... 14, there are more than 14 macaws in Chaco, but there was a big cache of, of 14 buried in Pueblo Benito near the high status family. Um, macaws, of course, come from Mesoamerica. Again, they, uh, Chris, my colleague Chris Schwartz and good friend uh, is much more expert on this than I. He would be another great person to speak on here if he hasn't been on yet. But um, you know, Chris and, and Pat Gilman and others have written about how macaws, you know, require specialized handling. So probably there's a maybe a class of people whose whose duty is to go back and forth between Chaco and Mesoamerica who know how to take care of these birds. And um, they can have quite they can be quite aggressive. They can have uh, real personalities. But what else is so striking about macaws? Well, their coloration, right? 
In the Southwest and in Mesoamerica as well, a very common aspect of indigenous cultures is to associate the cardinal directions plus the zenith and the nadir for a total of six with different colors. Well, how many colors do you have on a macaw? You have the red, the yellow, the blue, the green, the black and the white. So you have the four cardinal directions, white above and black below. So this bird is sort of like the center coming together of all directions and all places bird in one uh, incredible being coming from these unfathomable distances. And not only that, but macaws can speak. They've been known to learn people's names. We've all heard you know, parrots and macaws talking. So again, if for an average uh, ancient you know, farmer in the Chaco world, suddenly there's these powerful people in this canyon where the landscape is frozen ancient water and shells and they're giving you this amazing new drink that gets you all buzzed up and then you see a multicolor rainbow bird that's talking to you. Yeah, those people have power. And I would probably carry a tree uh, 75 miles for that. And we can see too, the macaw feathers are probably used to craft um, different aspects of clothing in, in the Chaco world, like this sash at the edge of the Cedars Museum near, um, or in Blanding, Utah. Probably was made in Chaco. There's a sort of roundabout argument for it, but we'll skip over that for now. Um, musical instruments, of course, also. Uh, conch shell trumpets, there were 17 found in Chaco. These, of course, make these amazing you know, trumpet sounds. And they have the watery association. In one case, there was a there was a conch shell trumpet in Benito that had a turquoise mouthpiece. So you've got, again, the sort of water times water with sound. Sound is so important in many native cultures as the way to sort of um, activate, to you know, activate a place or um, certainly in Diné cultures, a lot of the ceremonialism happens through song. And so to create sounds in Chacoan culture was again, one of these sensory experiences that, that manifested this sort of power of the leaders and the powerful realm they were trying to evoke. There's also flutes, like you see at the bottom of the screen here with frogs carved onto them. Again, you have water sound. And this um, landform shown in the back is a place called Tsebinohtsayelte, which is uh, the curved rock that speaks. And it's an uh, area of the cliff wall, the Chacoans, excavated out the sandstone to create this amphitheater with amazing acoustical properties that would reflect sound back. It would even create a standing wave, lots of uh, very powerful and interesting acoustic amplification and distortion. So this is probably, this is right between Pueblo Benito and Chetraquetl, the two largest buildings in the canyon, and probably one of the um, places where these rituals of sight and, of course, most importantly here, sound and taste and smell were, were being undertaken, where the sound was amplified and distorted in compelling ways. So ultimately, what I envision, and, and I think the, the, the picture I've tried to build for you all here is that while we look at Chaco and we see a place like this, you know, and the ancients would have seen the same thing, dry, no trees, harsh, sandstone through uh, the, the, the ritual practices crafted by the, the religious leaders in the canyon with macaws, with the sound of the bells, with the taste of cacao, it probably was evoking something much more like this. I would suggest something akin to this idea of the flower world that Jane Hill and others, again, Mike Matthewitz just did a book on the flower world an idea shared through numerous Mesoamerican cultures up into the Southwest of a sort of paradise realm um, beyond death or after death, full of water, full of bright colors and sounds and flowers. So I don't know that that's exact, like the exact contours of what it would have been at Chaco, but given these sort of brightness and the sonic qualities and the watery associations, I think they were creating this, this sort of paradise in the desert through these ritual practices and, and so we then see how these objects and their sensory qualities were really big players in Chacoan history into why the monumentality happened, why this huge regional scale society formed, why certain people acquired so much status and others didn't. So we've got a couple minutes and I just wanna walk you through one more example of uh, the power of landforms and water evidenced in Chaco and society from my more recent research on the roads. Um, 
So we'll just walk along that road and, and then wrap up. So this is what's known as the Southeast Road coming out of Chaco, whoops. It would be this one, right? We're looking right about here, just south of the canyon. Uh, this is where the road is. It's located on a bedrock exposure. There's no, keep in mind, there's no other bedrock exposure um, nearby. Everything else is covered up with soil. So the road comes in here. You can see it passes between a number of constructed features, which we'll look at one by one. The first is this, which is known as an aridura, a crescent, sort of a horseshoe shaped, crescent shaped, um, Feature very common on Chaco and roads. These are generally thought of as sort of shrines or blessing places. Um, you might get a couple of sherds or flakes of turquoise at a Herodura, but they're, they're certainly not encampments or, or anything like that. So there's one of these um, probably, you know, very sacred forms of architecture marking the road. There are these two single lines of stone. That's uh, just, it's just a single line of stone laid out across the sandstone, um, probably to demarcate the road. You come in, you know, turn here, don't go past here. And, and that's all that's present at this particular location along the road. So why, you know, why do they choose to mark this place with a shrine and these two little, whatever they are, road markers, alignments on this sandstone outcrop? Well, I happen to arrive here after a big July rainstorm. And I, I think the answer was, was um, one answer was suggested, which is that on this natural uh, outcropping, there are numerous shallow basins and pools where the rainwater collects and, and gathers after the rain. So this is a view from above and you see how this, sand, this uh, exposure is unique within the landscape. It's an affordance of this place. It only will occur here that the water will be pooled in this, compelling visual manner, sparkling in the afternoon sun. And so the Chacoans built one of these roads, again, not for trade and transport, not for carrying goods so much, but for uh, connecting places of power, religiously important places in the landscape and probably walking along them in procession or in races to this place where again, the water would pool, probably not even to collect, but to um, be manifested as this most sacred substance collecting in this one place on the landscape. But that's not it. Looking back towards Chaco from that exposure, you see here one of these incredible landscape alignments that is afforded again by this location. This is that uh, compelling, the, this is Fajada Butte where the sun dagger is. And you can see sitting right on top of it is this landform known as uh, Huerfano or Tzilfnao Difli, which is a uh, one of very important mountain for Navajo people, certainly for the Chacoans and, and this one very sacred landform sitting right on top of another, the two lined up. Only, you know, that vantage offered at this place where the rain is pooling and gathering. And that's where they took that road. That's where they built that shrine. So again, we're seeing the power of things like water, sandstone with shallow basins in it, two landforms lining up in why the, you know, why people built this 30 foot wide, very straight road, went to all that effort and all the subsequent things that happened on it in the unfolding of Chocolin history. Wow, that text got really messed up. What this slide would say, let me just change the text real quick so we can read it in case somebody's uh, taking notes or something. Okay, that worked. <laughs> Slides back on, thumbs up, yeah? Thumbs up. Okay. So what I've tried to show here, right, are the implications, not just for the history of Chaco, but for archaeology and, and really human history more broadly, the power of religion, of religious movements that sometimes in the contemporary West where, where like, you know, we religion gets conflated with Protestant Christianity, which means going to church once a week. That's not religion for most of human history. It's these beings, it's these entities. It's why people make the decisions they make, do what they do, why certain people get social status. So I've tried to show here the power of religion, the power of water, the power of land, the power of things, and their central role in human history, not just humans making decisions, but that it's all in an interwoven web with these other, what we can think of as actors, as, as um really animate beings in how histories unfold. But of course, practices would be needed to activate them. You know, people are doing things with the macaws. They're having gatherings. I think one of the most important practices, both for roads and for the exotic goods, are processions, where people would, you know, the, the powerful religious leaders would walk along these 
monumental performative roads decked out in turquoise, maybe playing the copper bells, carrying the macaws. Because for this stuff to have an impact, it has to be sort of shown off and used and sensed, experienced by multiple people. So I think these roads and, and gathering areas, processions in particular, are ways that that was accomplished. And of course, songs brought along with it to activate the roads, to um, bring that amphitheater alive and so forth. I've also tried to emphasize, you know, that we can think of histories in pre-colonial indigenous North America. So often our archeological narratives are about, um, well, the rain dried up and so they moved or about, uh, you know, oh, people built, like I, I work with um, grade school students every summer and you know, I ask them, what did you learn about native Americans in school this year? And it's usually, you know, they grew corn beans and squash and lived in teepees or something like that. Well, yeah, that's true, but they're just like any other human society. Native societies were complex, they were complicated, they had rises, they had falls, they had these amazing trade networks down, you know, across the continent, down into Mesoamerica, interlinked histories. For that topic, I'd highly recommend Tim Pocketat's new book, Gods of Thunder, showing how Cahokia, Chaco, the post-classic Maya, it's all tied together in one sort of medieval North American period. And I think we can see these developments Mesoamerica, Chaco Canyon, Cahokia, the importance of water, shells, cacao, it's really shared across this region down in, into Mesoamerica. And we can start thinking of histories rather than simply, uh, you know, sort of environmental adaption or, or some of these more simplistic narratives. And ultimately that the cultures in the Chacoan world, they maintain many of these elements, Pueblo and Dinep people still use lots of turquoise in their jewelry and their ceremonies. Um, copper you know, bells are parts of dances. There are macaw societies at numerous pueblos and macaw feathers. You can see dancers wearing them. So many of these elements live on. And yet the way that they were used, it would seem has transformed from the Chaco era when it was all about elite status and elite power as, as the quotes I shared from Pueblo and Diné people earlier showed, you know, that they were abusing their power, that the spiritual um, abilities and connections got taken out of control. So it's I think very important we remember that many of these elements live on in the societies today. It's not just something of the past, and yet the societies learned, they transformed, and, and they've survived. So with that, I thank you very much again for the invitation to speak and, and for your time. And I'm happy, I know I've gone a little, well, not too much over. I'm happy to field questions as uh, Jim and Mike see fit. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rob. That was fantastic. A great PowerPoint. <clears throat> I've been hitting up all the participants individually, and I've got such great comments. <clears throat> Let me go to the top here and uh, start with some questions. Um, is there any thought on the placement of the kivas, are they aligned to something in the sky other than the sun and moon, like planets or stars? Sorry, I muted myself and couldn't get it off. Uh, no one has systematically studied that question is the simple answer. I can say that there are Dinet traditions, this has been published openly, so there are Dinet traditions that um, Gosh, let me see if I can find a picture to illustrate this. There, well, there are Diné traditions that the floor features in the kivas are in dialogue with or representations of constellations, specifically, I think, Cassiopeia and Ursa Major, and then the hearth in the middle being the North Star. So there's a sense that the architectural elements are laid out as a, it's called Ika, uh, uh, sacred schematics is the, best translation I can think of. Um, so the feet, the architectural layout of the kivas is probably in dialogue with the stars. Um, where they're placed in the buildings, some would argue that, but it, I don't know that it's been uh, systematically shown. There's Casa Rinconada in Chaco where there's a window, the sun, a uh, sunlight comes through on when uh, summer solstice morning, lights up a niche on the wall. Others say that only happened when they reconstructed it. So um, a lot more research could be done on that question. Thank you. 
<clears throat> and Monet is asking, uh, I think she's in the airport in Boston waiting on a 5 a.m. flight, and she's looking at this program on her phone. <laughs> but she has a question. Have you heard that there are some Pueblo people who believe they are descended from the Maya? I was in New Mexico in June, and a local said this to me. Oh, yeah. Um, about every, yeah, all like I, across the board, my indigenous friends and colleagues are always reiterating, like, we're all connected. Uh, many have told me, you shouldn't even stop in Mesoamerica, you know? You need to be looking further south. I've heard of tribes in New Mexico who, who have words for the Amazon River, for example. And I know many Pueblo people who feel like a, yeah, a strong kinship with, with the Maya. They call them their ancestors. So um, people moved around, you know, a lot. And we're interested, again, as like, it's pretty undeniable that someone from Chaco and society was going down and getting macaws or that vice versa. But there was direct, you know, contact between peoples pretty far south to be getting cacao and macaws, not necessarily Maya land, but it could be, could be. Um, so yeah, archeologists often get very uh, tight about the idea. And I can understand because I don't think it would be right to argue like the Maya marched up and built Chaco directly, but the two are definitely connected. And I know a lot of indigenous Southwestern people feel um, that those are their their relatives. Those yeah. are their relatives in Mexico. And um, also there's a lot of feathered snakes or feathered serpents, uh, pictographs or petroglyphs in the Southwest. So that tradition, as well as the tradition of the hero twins, uh, came way up as far as the U.S. Southwest. Um, thank you so much for mentioning Cacao. <clears throat> and Cheryl Norman, who's with us tonight, her husband, Garth Norman, worked uh, at the site of Izapo, where scholars believe uh, that the Mesoamerican calendars were first initiated. And uh, she's made a comment that Cacao is all over Izapa, Mexico, Temple Center. <laughs> yeah, I've been there and- uh, I love it, I love it. I've, I've been there many times. Um, and what's interesting is one time, what was it in, in 2010 or 11, before, before 2012, with the beginning of the new Maya Grand Cycle, um, we, I was part of a group with the Maya Conservancy, and we took 13 Maya elders from the highlands of Guatemala, Momostenango, spiritual elders. We took them into uh, Mexico, into Izapa, <clears throat> so that they could perform a ceremony ritual to reignite the sacred fire in the place where the calendars were born. And we walked through a grove of cacao trees as we walked in and, and I took two big cacao pods and I went and I put them on the, uh, the blankets they had there ready for offerings for the eventual fire and taught Rigoberto, who led the event, uh, he came over to me and he said, what are these? And I go, they're cacao pods. And the Quiches had never seen, because they're in the highlands, they had never seen cacao growing. But yet, even at his annual uh, little teaching, he's got a three-day teaching event where they bring the school children and bring everybody teaching about the Mayans and the customs and all this. The entrance to that will be a cacao bean, but he had never seen a cacao pot. I thought that was something wild. <laughs> That's an amazing story. But it shows that, yeah, these things, right? Our life is entangled with them. <laughs> right. Um, 
And let's see, Stephen is asking, where did the people live and where did they farm? Sorry. Okay, where did people live? Well, uh, some people... If you can hear me, you're I'm breaking just... up. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to get back to the map. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Throughout this, people, these little dots has a great house, a Chaco style monument building surrounded by, you know, 10 to 20 households. But people, I'd like to have my laser pointer. Oh, there it is. So this area, the Chuska Mountains, lots of very good farming, big communities. Down here, this is called the uh, Red Mesa Valley. Lots of communities, good farming, you know, good rainfall. So up here, around modern day Farmington, <laughs> Farmington, right? Good farming up around there. Uh, these sites are pretty well watered around Mesa Verde. So there's... A lot of, you know, I think Steve Lexen quotes an estimate of like 100,000 people in, in this Chaco world, 60 to 100,000. I'm a little rusty on that right now, but there were plenty of people, just not that many living in the canyon itself. There were people living in the small houses in the canyon, probably never more than, I would say never more than a thousand. The the uh, soil scientist who has really looked into the question. I mean, there is a very hotly debated issue in Chaco research, but I think the best interpretation is that you could, the best farming in Chaco would have been in the side canyons and that would have produced enough food for a few hundred people. And historically, Diné Navajo people lived in Chaco Canyon and never more than a few hundred and they all had farms elsewhere because it was so harsh. So farming is good here along the Chuscas, Red Mesa Valley, up north. So I hope that answers the question. And here is a, uh, I think you just answered this, but Mary Beth uh, put in a question. What is your view of the outlier communities settled from Chaco as a center or local communities replicating Chaco? Uh, I, I really don't believe the replication thing. I think it's a central idea that starts in Chaco, just like, this isn't a perfect analogy, but like Rome, and then you have, uh, you know, spread of an architecture out from a sacred center. So I see the distribution of outliers as the distribution of the Chaco and religious movement, certain way of building buildings relating to the sun, the moon, the water, certain prayers, building roads. It's, it's this complex of stuff that's all related to how people try and create relationships with the powerful entities of the world. So their lives go well. That's my understanding of it. And was there a political structure tying them together? Probably. I think that's actually a little harder uh, question to assess than whether, uh, I mean, what's shared is architecture, pottery designs, road architecture, and um the great houses are monumental things lining up on landforms and, and astronomy and the roads are processional avenues going to springs and astronomical events and shrines. So what's shared is religious architecture. There's probably a political underlying uh, structure. I, I wouldn't doubt it. Steve Lexon would definitely say yes, but um, <laughs> that's what I think it is. And I don't think people are just, uh, copying. I think they're really tied together in, in the way that they're all practicing a tradition. Yeah, Steve's a great guy. We had him speak uh, oh months ago, and we'll probably have him uh, present again next year. And and there's been a couple of people in the chat. I've been, they were mentioning Steve. Uh, <clears throat> but Carol Steve was on my uh, dissertation committee. <laughs> oh, wow. That's great. Great. Sure. Carolyn Tate, who's going to be our presenter on October 9th. She's here with us tonight and she has a comment. 
She goes, in Mesoamerica, divination often employed shallow pools of water. A possible explanation for roads over exposed bedrock with shallow basins. Yeah. I, you know, I don't want to get too into this topic because it's a little bit sensitive with, with some Pueblo communities, but pooled bodies of water are really, really important relating to kind of a, a connection, let's say, between two realms. So I think that would certainly tie in with divination. Um, and I think that's part of what's so important with those pooled bodies of water as well. Hmm. And Monet, still waiting on her plane in Boston, uh, she likes the idea of copper bell sounds reflecting rainwater, and she wants to quote you. <laughs> Great. Wow. <laughs> At least one person doesn't think I'm totally nuts. <laughs> Thank you. And Cheryl Norman's asking who wrote The God of Wonder? Gods of Thunder is a book by Tim Pocketat. Tim, P-A-U-K-E-T-A-T, -E -T, another very dear mentor, uh, dissertation committee member, and um, the sort of the Cahokia guy, the guy when it comes to Cahokia. And that's a great, it's a really fun read. Mm -hmm. All righty. And... Um... David is rendering Rob. It's a long thing here. You worked in Turkey. You are no doubt familiar with another religious movement that came and went in Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, Jordan in the 12th century. You have contemporaneous, contemporaneous recorded history that identifies that moment where it came from Europe. What became of it and everything we need to know about the people who brought that movement? The religious colonizers left behind monumental architecture and fortresses, but we would not refer to them as ancestral to the indigenous Arab people or refer to their abandoned buildings as ancestral Arab. Similarly, are the ancestral Pueblo and Pueblo descendants the proper terms to use for Chaco or the only plausible terms to apply to Chaco. We still have no empirical evidence of what became of the Chacoans, no recorded history, no linguistic evidence, no DNA, no continuity between Chaco architecture and roads with the modern Pueblos, and no continuity of the long distance trade to the South. Wow, okay. Um, there's a lot, but what I can say, let's see. Uh, Yes, a religious movement that came and went in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan in the 12th century. Yeah, I think it's a it's a compelling uh, parallel. Like that could be one way to uh, think, right? There's a spread of architecture, monumentality. Exactly. Now, as for the question of ancestral Pueblo, ancestral Arab, Pueblo descendants, um. I mean, there are, so you, you say here, no recorded history. I guess that that would belie a, a, a strong, that, that would be discounting oral traditions, which, which Pueblo people do share, have shared and do hold about Chaco. No linguistic evidence that could be, you know, you, you could look at um, Winds from the North by Scott Ortman, where there are uh, pretty, powerful linguistic arguments connecting contemporary Tewa people to Mesa Verde. So that's relatively connected to Chaco. No DNA. Um, there have been, you know, it, it's, it's sort of illegal to do a lot of DNA studies, but those that have been done point, could point both to, to Pueblo people and Navajo people today. Um, but of course, the contemporary tribes are not happy with their ancestors' bones being um, scientized through DNA. So that's understanding. No continuity between Chaco architecture and roads with the modern Pueblos. That I would probably disagree with as well. The architecture, yeah, they're not building great houses and they're not building 30 foot wide roads. But the very concept of road lives on as extremely central in Pueblo cultures today and Navajo cultures. Uh, and no continuity of the long distance trade to the south. There are 
macaw feathers used in 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 many pueblo dances today so i would say there is some continuity of that trade uh over time but um i mean you are raising the point that you know what what we call the people chacoins ancestral pueblo anasazi there, there's always a, a political component um there were many objections to calling them Anasazi because that's a Navajo word, Anasase. Uh, there's objections to calling it Ancestral Pueblo because that alienates other indigenous groups, especially the Diné. Um, calling them the Chacoans in some ways uh, alienates both groups because they are ancestral to the, uh, they're descended from the Chacoans. So it's a, uh, what to call the people is very tricky, but um, I usually go with Chacoans or Ancestral Four Corners people. Um, and then try and speak to different tribal connections um, as best I can. That's great. <clears throat> Robert would like to know, is there any evidence of gold as an elite good? And if so, was it referred to as uh, God or sun excrement like in Mesoamerica? Oh, I'm sorry. My internet froze and I think it just... It's frozen okay? right now again. All right, there you are. Oh. Okay. I think I'm back. Sorry. Guess it's an internet <laughs> thing. Yeah, that happened earlier when you were talking, just beginning to talk about the turquoise. It kind of froze up and, and a little sporadic, but then you came back um so one of the words for gold in maya is uh excretement of the sun have, have mm. they found any gold uh i don't know if any gold that's ever been found in chaco yeah that's interesting though <laughs> can you share the author of the title that you re referenced gods of thunder Oh yeah, again, that's uh, Tim Pocketat. I can put it in the chat here. Uh, Gods of Thunder. Tim. Yep. Okay. And Monet's still thinking in the airport and she thinks that's great. It's the astronomical connection too, I think, to the Maya. Oh yeah. Again, some archaeologists get very um, defensive when that is suggested, but the post, you know, the classic period collapse or reorganization, if you don't like the word collapse, was right before the rise of Jocko. And, and I would imagine that ideas had always been sort of trickling north, but especially with the massive social transformation in the wake of a societal collapse. Uh, some of these high status people, astronomers and so forth, you know, maybe they're going to new places. Their old capitals are gone. And some of that knowledge, I'm sure, drifted north. Uh, additionally, I don't remember the other thing. Yeah, I think we I think we can leave it at uh, the astronomy would certainly be a possible connection. Oh, I remember the other thing is that also turquoise becomes very uh valued in mesoamerica in the post-classic period at places like uh the Tol you know toltec society and post-classic maya Ch uh i think it's at chichen they have those amazing turquoise mosaic masks you all would know and can correct me but um and the aztecs have lots of turquoise mosaics and, and there's an idea again they've had trouble with the chemical sourcing and they haven't been able to bring it uh you know nail it definitively but there's an idea that a lot of that turquoise is coming down from Chaco because they would have had to trade something for the macaws and the cacao. And I don't think the people in Mesoamerica needed corn from, you know, rain starved San Juan basin of New Mexico. So I'm guessing they're sending turquoise in exchange for the cacao and the macaws. I'd like to look in that, into that idea more in, in the future with some chemical sourcing. And uh, I have a, an article about the macaws uh, in the upcoming uh, September Aslander everybody can look forward to. And if you're not already a 
subscriber to the Ask Lander. It's free monthly issues. So just give me your email address in the chat feature to Jim Reed, your host. And Jean has sent me a message, but it's like she's talking to you. Uh, she's engaged in an ongoing discussion with a few other visual artists regarding the issue of rep repetitive labor, a lot of energy expenditure, as being more of a form of prayer. Your talk reminds me, we do the work ourselves. I wonder about the Chaco instance. Were there any slaves or could the transport of lumber, rock and so on have been a part of, of a religious action? Yeah, I, I like that. And I think it's uh, I think it's probably a bit of both. In today's world, uh, you know, there are people who would see us the same act as true religious devotion, sincere. And they would see others would see it as economic exploitation or sort of culty slaveness. So I, I'm sure the same thing was happening in Chaco and society and, and many societies in the ancient times that uh, there were people who were fervent and thought it was the right thing to do. And they believed and they were happy to carry the trees on their foreheads, you know, 75 miles. And then there were people who had to kind of had to do it. Um, <laughs> And maybe there were repercussions for not doing so. I mean, there are Navajo traditions that say people were enslaved at Chaco. There's some decent archaeological evidence. I mean, it would kind of be weird if there weren't captives. Almost every small scale society had captives. So um, I think it's it's a it's a mixed question that there was both religious devotion and some people who probably didn't want to play along and yet did, whether by force or not. Um, it's hard to say. Hmm. And Jacqueline. And Lynn uh, made a comment, presence of jewelry workshops, drilling bead areas in great houses or outliers, or obtained through trade all drilled. Also mosaic pieces to be attached to ceramic produced locally or imported intact, or shell workshops, drilling mosaics and so on. Great question. And I need to brush up on the details of, of what's known about this a little bit better, but I do know, I think in some great houses, there's evidence of turquoise working. There's definitely evidence of turquoise working in um, the small houses in Chaco Canyon. And so I don't think they're importing it already shaped. They're, they're shaping it there. I kind of wonder if there might, like in, in, in uh, ancient Hawaii, there was a class of people who sort of made prestige goods and ornaments for the elites. And I kind of wonder if there was a similar class at Chaco who were, who's, you know, sort of their cast, their charge in life was to work the turquoise. Um, so I, they were working it in the, they were obtaining it from distances ranging from less than a hundred miles to hundreds of miles and then working it in the Canyon and then depositing it in offerings in a lot of cases, or probably wearing it as, as lavish jewelry. Um, mosaic pieces to be, yeah, they were also probably forming the mosaic pieces in the canyon. The shell probably came and worked, like those shell bracelets look really ho-ho-kam. The ho-ho-kam worked a lot of shell, and so I think probably some of that was coming in um, already worked. But I think that would have been, again, like, uh, Maybe it was a cast. Again, maybe it was a religious act to make stuff out of this sacred blue stone of the water and of the sky. All right. Well, is any more anybody else got a question? These were really great questions. I, I appreciate everybody asking them and, and staying tuned on. Especially here on the East Coast, it's it's a little late. I don't know. People are probably all over the world. So anyway, thank you for <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Mary Beth says, thank you. Monet in Boston says she's never using her frequent flyer miles again. <laughs> Waiting around for till 5 a.m. to get a flight. Cheryl says, many thanks for an outstanding presentation. Ross, give me your email address quick, please. Um, 
And Phil Hunger, um, you've got to give me your email address for me to put you on the list. Your only your name shows up to me, so you got to give me your email address in a separate email. And thank you, Carl. Um. Rob did put the author in of the Gods of Thunder. If anybody checks their chat, uh, let's see. Gene is hoping you'll give us a bibliography. This has been an inspiration. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> uh -huh. I could put together some titles. Sure. Well, I know at least two other books I mentioned. I'll just put them in the chat. One was Ulysses Sale by Mary Helms. And the other was The F New Flower World by Mike Matthewitz. All right. So there's the two other books I, that I remember mentioning. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Rob. That was really good. And thank you for watching this Atslender YouTube channel. And please subscribe to our channel to receive free monthly issues of the Atslender Magazine of the Americas Contact your host Jim Reed at mayaman at bellsouth.net. Thanks again.